What's up, family? Whether you're joining us here at NRH, Keller, West Fort Worth, Dallas, online, thank you for waking up this morning. That one hour was like, oof, but God is worth it, amen? Hey, I'm honored. I'm honored to be with you. I'm honored to uh, wrap up this two-week series. If you were with us last week, we spoke about the pursuit of God and how the pursuit of God should change us. And we were encouraged around the idea that if we are aware of God more, we would sense his pursuit more and then therefore live a changed life. And last week, I asked all of us to set a reminder on your phone, try to every day stop down and say, okay, God, I'm aware of you. So I hope you practiced that some. I know me and my wife did. It changed our week and our boys' week. It was a gift. Well, today we're talking about the God who restores, and I don't know about you, but I need restoration every single day. So I'm not a big college football fan. Um, Ever since moving to Texas, I know a thing or two now because that's like the culture here, but there's one college football player. Uh, He went to Texas A&M. He was a QB1. His name is Johnny Menzel. Uh, Johnny, typically, he like gets different reactions from people because he was a stud, amazing career in college, but then started dabbling in things he shouldn't have, and that derailed his personal life, and his NFL career was short-lived. On the other hand, there's a college football star named Reggie Bush. I have a photo for you. He played for USC, had an amazing college career and an amazing NFL career. Both of them won Heisman trophies, okay? Okay. Well, in recent news, you may have not heard, but Reggie lost his Heisman years ago because the NCAA said he received money from his university, and that was illegal back then. Well, now it's illegal. Every college athlete can get paid. So Johnny Menzel takes to social media, and he tells the Heisman committee, if you do not restore Reggie's trophy, I'm not coming to ceremony anymore. Here's the point. When you yourself have needed restoration for something, you begin to have eyes and even advocacy for those who need restoration too. More on that later, but if you can open up your Bible once more to Jonah 3, and uh, if you would allow me to lead you in that liturgy again, uh, just repeat after me before we read the scriptures. Uh, Say, Jesus, I give you my mind. I give you my heart. Speak to me through your word. Jonah 3, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, everybody say this time. time. Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. Okay. Chapter 3 begins in the same way chapter 1 began. Did you notice this? It begins with God speaking to Jonah, giving him instruction on where to go and even what to say. The only difference in Jonah chapter 3, 1 to 3, and Jonah chapter 1, 1 to 3, is that this time Jonah obeyed. Everyone say, this time. Here's why that matters. I am so grateful for that phrase because I've needed many this times in my life. Maybe that time I didn't obey, but this time I did. Uh, Maybe that time I couldn't see God, but this time I stopped down and I looked and I searched. Or maybe that time I chose my way over God's way, but this time I chose different. Have you ever had a this time season? Have you ever needed a second chance in your life? Because that's all it is. It's a second chance. But I hesitate with saying second chance because I've needed this time more than just twice. I've needed this time opportunities time and time and time again. And so because church isn't just a time for us to hear someone speak at you, I hope that it's a time for us to allow God to speak to us and then us to speak to each other Here's what I want us to do. We'll do it twice today. This is the first. I want us to take a moment of reflection, wherever you are, online, at all of our locations. Take a moment to reflect. When was the last time you had a this time season? Where you feel like God gave you a second chance. Think about it. Maybe you're in one right now. Take a second. Okay.
okay, I hope something surfaced for you. I want you to hold on to that for later. But you see, this time Jonah obeyed. This was a shot at redemption for Jonah, or some will say restoration for Jonah, and he took it. You see, we never fully arrive on this side of heaven. Uh, just at all of our locations, just raise your hand if you're perfect. Anyone? <laughs> just see. It's like, raise your hand, because if you are, I will worship you. None of us are perfect. This is why we need to continue to wrap our minds around the fact that even though we're good, good is not enough because we will fail. We will fall short. And if we are good, how good is good enough? We need to be perfect because there's a gap between our goodness and perfection. I mean, we can think about it this way. If, uh, if a husband is faithful most of the time, but only cheats a couple times, what does it make him? He's a cheater. If an athlete is 80% of the time clean, 20% of the time he or she dabbles in some performance enhancing, they're a cheater. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that I believe that you are a good person. I love you. I believe it. I hope I'm a good person, but, but there's a gap. <laughs> Who's going to fill the gap for us? This is the tension I want us to walk in today because it's our temptation to think that this message is for them. This message is for all of us today. God's seasons don't always work like our seasons do, and that is frustrating. Maybe some of you woke up this morning and you're fired up for springtime. You're like, let's go. Flowers bloom. Birds are chirping. You are stoked. But if we're honest, in a moment of reflection and contemplation, there's nothing flourishing in your life, and that is frustrating. You're like, God, spring is happening in nature, but spring isn't springing in me. What do I do? It's frustrating and difficult. But God sees you. Maybe recently you fell back into an old sin cycle, and that's frustrating. Or maybe you fell off of your groove of a prayer discipline or liturgy practices, and you're frustrated by that. Or maybe, because no one is perfect, you made a mistake. But then that mistake has brought you shame and embarrassment. And so, here's the good news in all of that. It's never too late for any of us to follow the way of Jesus. And if we're honest... All of us need to recommit every single morning. You can still be like Jesus. You can still become like Jesus. And you can still do what Jesus did. So let's look at what Jonah got to experience even after his disobedience. Look at verse 4. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. And the people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Friends, God allows Jonah to see these wicked people repent and turn back to God. These were words that came from disobedient lips, and yet they still worked. Are you listening to me? Jonah had a history an occurrence, really, of disobedience. Everything we know about Jonah, good standing man in the eyes of God, popular prophet, reliable guy. But one occurrence of disobedience did not disqualify him from still speaking God's words. Do you believe that for you? Maybe you've disqualified yourself because you thought, ah, did it again. Messed up again. I can't go to church and respond for prayer. I'm not worthy of that. I did it again. But here's what I want to do. I want to point us back to the one who matters most. You see, Jonah disobeyed, and God still used his, his lips. What kind of God will allow one that ran from him be the one who spoke for him? It's this kind of God, a God who restores after disobedience. In verse 4, did you even notice in Jonah's prophecy to the people that Jonah only spoke about the destruction that was to come and not the potential restoration that can come if they repent? The full message here is, unless they repent, then, you know, 
boom, you know. <laughs> Destruction. No bueno. I only speak two languages. That's all I got, you know. It's like even after Jonah walked through all of that, he himself still needed God to work on him. Can anybody relate to that? It's like you would think that I've gone to enough with God that like by now I, I just I won't fail anymore. <laughs> like, like, like Jonah, you ran from God. You got on a boat. God sent a storm. You were dying. God saved you with a fish, spit you out. You said you're going to obey. You obeyed partially. Come on, Jonah. And like for me, it's like, come on, Emmanuel, you know? Maybe you could say, come on, and, and just say your name. Because when we look to ourselves, it's, like, it's frustration regularly. I could do better. I could be more. But thanks be to God, he asks us, hey, lift up your head. Look to me. Thank you, God. Come on, Jonah. Thank you, God. Come on, Emmanuel. Thank you, God. Have you been mostly obedient in your life? Have you been mostly faithful? On the other hand, have you been mostly discouraged in your life? Maybe mostly shameful? What I want to illustrate here is that whatever your life has led you to until now, and whatever you are mostly filled of, because none of us are perfect, and so maybe we're mostly good, mostly bad, mostly a mix of good, bad, and ugly, thanks God for still loving me kind of thing, no matter how your DNA of goodness and badness shows up today at, all, at every location, the good news is there's a God who's 100% perfect and can fill the gaps that you have. Can somebody say amen to that reality? And so God, even in our gaps, thank you for being 100% good. I'll say it this way, and this is complex, so write this down. Allow God to be God and you to not. That's the sermon, people. I mean, that's, that's my offering. Allow him to be him. Jonah's big issue is that, and we can relate to this, Jonah tried to do God's job for him. He did. No, but God, this, I mean, really, Jonah, really us, our job is to follow the way of the way. That's it. So thank you, God, for restoring us every time we disobey. Look at what happens in Nineveh after Jonah said destruction is coming. Verse number six. When the king of Nineveh heard that Jonah was saying, or what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, wow, and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps yet God will change his mind and back and change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. And when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Only God can fill the gap, friends. Nineveh is a place that has been an enemy of the Israelites forever. I mean, generation after generation, violence, atrocities, ugly things. And here's the deal. Jonah grew up seeing these things, hearing about these things. He doesn't want to go to those people. So much darkness there. But did you read it, friends? The king of Nineveh himself stepped off his throne. And he surrendered his royal robes in exchange for burlap and ashes. What kind of king would do that? If you were with us last week, I said, no king leaves his throne to pursue anyone or anything. But when the king of kings enters the throne room, something changes, something changes. You see, this king with a lowercase k realized, even from his throne, I got to get off this thing because the king of kings, Yahweh, just entered the picture. It's amazing what we see happening in our text right now. 
declares a decree for all of Nineveh, fast, pray, dress yourself in mourning. We have gone astray, but today we got to turn back to God. We got to, we got to turn back from God and fasting and desperation. The king himself leads the surrender. It's incredible what we see happening. This is what happens when Yahweh enters the room. You see, Nineveh, perhaps for the first time, saw their sin for what it is. And I hope we do too, that we see our sins as death and destruction. Oh, it could feel good in the moment. Let's be real now. Temporary satisfaction, it's incredible sometimes what sin makes us feel. But the people of Nineveh realized the path here is not worth walking anymore. They saw their sins rightly. So here's the next question. What kind of God will respond in mercy to a wicked city weeping for his mercy? It's the God who restores after darkness. Man, at that time, there were cities that were dark, but y'all, Nineveh was dark, man. So much dark things happening. When I say Nineveh, what comes to mind for you? You know, for me, this hits home rather personally because the city that I'm from, a lot of Christians call my home city a, um, a godless city. And, and that angers me. It angers me just because just because you don't see God working doesn't mean he's not. It angers me because just because a city is heading down the path of destruction doesn't mean that it is too late for the light of God's word and presence to redeem that city. Amen. This is what happened in Nineveh. It is not too late. And God is proving that here that I feel like at the buzzer in verse 10, God says, okay, I'll withhold my fierce anger that is justly due. It happened in Nineveh. But I'm declaring it's happening in Fort Worth, it's happening in Keller, it's happening in Dallas, it's happening at NRH, it's happening in your home, in your workplaces, in your family. God can restore to better than before. He just has to be there. That's all it takes. You see, man, and and I don't know, sometimes it's so hard for us to grasp this, perhaps because the voice of the enemy is louder to us than the voice of the Lord, but... That's why we are doing seven weeks of hearing the voice of God, because we want you to discern and trust God's voice better. But do you believe that God can restore to better than before? Do, Do you believe that just because darkness has come over you in your season, that there is still hope, that the light of God in a moment can absolutely diminish darkness? Do you believe that? It's happy to hear. I hope that you are verbally affirming at every location because here's the reality. Man, even if you don't believe it, it doesn't change the reality. And that is good news for us because our God does not back up when darkness comes. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. Everyone is running away and God runs towards. It's incredible. Everyone, Jonah is running away from Nineveh and God says, "Uh uh-uh, you run towards them. You run towards the messes. You run towards the darkness. You run towards them. What kind of God will call Nineveh a great city? What are they doing for you, God? They don't care about you. They don't worship you. They don't honor you. And yet he uses that adjective to describe that city. You see, can I preach for a second? Our God will see a dark world in need of hope and not leave it to rot in hell, but instead choose to send himself in the form of his son to die for all sin. I mean, take on a cross, despising or scorning its shame. And not just that, but he will raise up three days later to defeat hell, darkness, and the grave. This is the God we serve. It's amazing. It's amazing. And this is why we implore you, church, don't be like a, like a timid Easter inviter person, if that makes sense. <laughs> you got to be bold, baby. You got to say, okay, if this is true, 
If I have a risen Savior that runs towards darkness, the least I can do is say, hey, come to church with me. Easter's coming to just come with me. I know church is in your thing, neighbor, distant family member. I know you've been hurt perhaps, but, but just come because the God that I know, maybe you've had a bad experience with the God you thought he was, but my God runs towards darkness, not away from it. So come as you are. Be that person that boldly invites people to come to Easter. It's the least we can do in light of the news of Jesus. But we all have a heart. And sometimes our hearts are impure and sometimes we struggle. Let's look at Jonah's heart together in chapter 4, verse 1. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. I hope that you've complained to God before. I certainly hope that's not the extent of your prayer life with God. I hope that your whole life is God's. And when you want to give adoration, because he's due, give it. When you want to bring a petition, give it. Stand in the gap in intercession, do it. But if we're honest, sometimes we just got to say, I'm frustrated, God. I'm angry. What I thought was going to happen didn't happen, and I feel dumb. But... Have you ever had like some privacy to maybe pray out loud in a moment of complaint and you got to kind of hear what you're saying and you're like, I sound foolish right now, man. You know what I mean? God, Jonah, you're complaining to God for being incredible. For being merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and turning away from wrath. You're complaining about that. Cool, 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 cool. Cool, 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 cool. It's ridiculous. But honestly, that's me. If I'm honest, once I hear myself, I'm like, oh, I was complaining that my coworker got the promotion and not me. I'm complaining because you're a God that provides. You didn't see me. You saw them, and I feel lost, but I'm complaining that you're good. I'm complaining that that marriage got restored, but mine is still struggling. God, how dare you restore them and not me. Are you, am I making sense? We complain to God for being himself, perhaps because we don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. But remember, just allow God to be God and you to not. Easier said than done. And I want you and God wants you. Continue to bring your complaints to God. Continue to bear yourself before the Lord. He can handle it. <laughs> Jonah continues. Look at verse 3. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I pr predicted will not happen. And the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? And then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. So much I can say here. Jonah receives restoration from God. Amazing. God restores him. And then because, whew, listen, because his obedience did not bear the fruit that he expected, he now wants to relinquish his restoration back to God. God, I was obedient. And if what I predicted didn't happen, then take back my life. I don't want it. Yeah, you saved it and restored it, but kill me now. Have you ever like gone shopping and purchased something you wanted so bad and then maybe you bought it and went home and checked your bank account and two days later you're like I need to return this item and so you go and you return this item and you're like I feel good about that for the week because I could not afford that friends you cannot afford God's restoration Jonah couldn't and here's the good news because you can't afford it, should you return it? This is the tension that we feel. We feel like, well, because I can't afford it, I can't accept it. 
And so we refuse the restoration of God because we're looking at ourselves. I'm not good. I can't do it. If what I did didn't go the way I planned, and I don't want it. And I think what God is doing ever so gently to Jonah, I just feel like he's a good dad because he is. Hey, bud, is it right for you to be angry about this right now? Jonah, can you actually look to me for a second? You realize all of Jonah's statements is I. If I predicted, if I, if you didn't kill me. Not. Friends, if you do too much focus on you, then you're going to lose you. I know, it's upside down kingdom. Try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, if you look to the king, you will save it. He will restore it to better than before. Verses six through nine in our text today, uh, I want you to read it this week. Basically, I told you last week, if you were with us, when you see the phrase arranged for, and it happens four times in Jonah, it happens three times in six to nine, it's God using nature to meet uh, Jonah where he's at. Well, in six to nine, Basically, God sends a plant while Jonah is watching to see what happens to the city to be a shelter for Jonah. And then God also sends a worm to eat the plant. So now Jonah's hot and he's even more angry, catching a fit. Look at verse 10, what the Lord says. You feel sorry about the plant. Well, you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? We don't know how the story ends with Jonah. It kind of ends with a cliffhanger question that God asks him. But here's what I do know. I do know that no matter what the rest of Jonah's life played out to be like, I know that our God is a God that restores after disillusion. You see, Jonah was disillusioned, man. Disappointed. Disillusion happens when what you expect and what actually occurred, there's a gap. So who's going to fill the gap? Who's going to fill the gap of our imperfection? Who's going to fill the gap of our expectation? Who's going to fill the gap of our salvation? Because if we're honest, we cannot save ourselves. And so I wish I knew what happened in Jonah's story, but I don't. I just know that our God is unchanging. And that even after disappointment and disillusion, Jonah and the gap that he had, the distance that he had, could have been restored by God. Consider Luke 24. There's two friends walking to Emmaus, Cleopas and his buddy. They went to Passover. They expected to see Jesus, their hopeful Messiah, maybe preach a good sermon, be a part of the festivities. And instead, they saw their hopeful Messiah crucified on a cross. Imagine that disillusion. They went to Passover hopeful and maybe left back to Emmaus, this illusion. Then it's Resurrection Sunday, but they don't know it. And so the resurrected Jesus starts walking with them and talking with them. And by the end of their journey, Cleopas and his friend realized, my eyes are open. Jesus, you are the hopeful Messiah that can restore us. I want to make it more personal. A year ago, I was in the park in Fort Worth, and my wife was with me. I had my son Levi with me, and Levi's playing, and he begins playing with this other young boy, and, and y'all know me. I have my Yankee hat on. I always wear hats, and uh, there was a guy named Mike who says, yo, New York, and I'm like, skr, skr, yeah, you know, <laughs> and we start talking about New York, and we start talking about what we do. He tells me he had like moved to Fort Worth like within the month. And I tell him, man, I've been here seven years. So I'm giving restaurant recommendations, all the things. And then he asked me, man, like, what do you do for work? And I'll be honest with you, church. I, I don't like saying that I'm a minister when I'm trying to engage somebody because where I'm from, if you say you're a minister, it's like, yep, have a good life. Don't want to talk. <laughs> so instead, I, I, I just felt led. I'm like, yeah, man, I work for a church, go to this church here, whatever. And he was so gracious about that. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. And he starts telling me a little bit about his own disillusion. He has an auntie and a grandma who loved God, but he himself, he felt like he needed to get to God. 
that God can't get to him, that, that he needed to know enough Bible in order to come into the walls of a church, that he needed to know more about God before ever coming to a local church. And so I invite him. He doesn't come to men's conference. He doesn't come to church for a couple months. But then I get a text randomly that says, hey, man, I came to church today, the one you invited me to. I want more of God. And, and just a couple months after that, I have this picture. Mike got baptized, and he put on Jesus. And it was an incredible, incredible moment in my own discipleship because I saw with my own eyes God can restore anybody. And he can restore to even better than before. Now Mike tells me all the time he wants to be a minister of the gospel. And so uh, I, I, I know Mike is at one of our locations, and he, he loves Jesus, and I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm very proud of you, Mike. You see, we're all being someone, becoming something, and even doing things. And we wonder, okay, God, are you even listening to my prayers? God, and if you are, how or what do I do to be restored? Consider the words from God in 2 Chronicles. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore. Everyone say restore. Restore their land. Here's our second and final moment of reflection because I don't want you to like get in your car and go home and try to remember what we did together. I want to give you an opportunity while it's fresh to talk to God about it. Maybe you've been running. Maybe somebody in your world has been running. Secret sin, shame. Maybe actually this is your first time in church in a while, so you've been physically running from the presence of God and Christian community. Here's what we're going to do. For a moment of concentration, you can either close your eyes and have your hands out like this, beautiful practice, or you can see the words on the screen, but we're going to sing words over you. This is God's perspective while Jonah was running, but I think you and I can probably see ourselves in the words of this song. So, so as the words wash over you, will we just be with God for a moment? Let's do that.
happened to me. Yeah. God doesn't necessarily want you to stop running. Too many people think that before they can get restored, they have to stop and get their lives together before they could come to God. Well, last week you learned, we learned, God pursues you. And this week, hopefully we've received, God could restore you. So keep running, but just know, sooner or later, I'm declaring, you will run right into the arms of God. Because the bottom line is this, God can restore you no matter what you've gone through. Pray with me, please. Uh, Jesus, here we are. Grateful for the opportunities to reflect, yeah, to see you rightly for a moment in community. But God, I pray and I hope that it doesn't end here, that hopefully we've learned the practice together in community. Oh, I could stop down. I could reflect. I could allow prophetic words to wash over me. I could open up my Bible and ask you to speak to me. I could, could, I could give you my mind. I could give you my heart. God, I'm begging you as a son would you release us from any orphan spirit in the room and every location and online? If anybody under the sound of my voice, God, actually believes that they don't belong to you because of what they've done, oh God, please, would you help them lift up their head and their gaze off of themselves and back to you? That you are a God of pursuit and a God of restoration. Oh God, that no devil in hell, that nothing, no man, no turbulence, no tribulation can separate us from the love of God. And so love, be near. Jesus, be near. Restore our souls again this morning and await for us to ask you again tomorrow morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen.